Hi, everyone. Welcome back from the break. Uh, before we get to this next panel, which we're really, really looking forward to, I would like to remind you of the hacking competitions in the Hacking Village. There are some really cool things going on there, like ICS Humla penetration testing and Hack the Bank, where you actually get to hack an ATM and get the money inside. Also, the IoT Village, where if you hack Internet of Things devices, you can actually take, the home, take them home afterwards. So uh, do go by and have some fun with that. And now it's time for uh, the panel of the day. And we're debating a hot topic in cybersecurity, which is the current challenges of cybersecurity uh, policies and legislation. And here with us uh, today are some of the people who are closest to the action. Uh, I'd like to invite on stage Katalin Grula, pre president of the IT committee from the Chamber of Deputies. Christian Kuku, CIO of the Secretary of State of the Romanian Government. Christian Driga, Counselor uh, for the Cooperation Department at CERT Row. And Bogdan Manola, Executive Director for the Association for Technology and Internet. And uh, our moderator today will be Lucian Constantin, cybersecurity journalist and contributing writer for Forbes, Vice, Motherboard, The New Stack, and Secur Security Boulevard. You've certainly read some of his pieces. If not, uh, it's about time you did. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Looking forward to uh, your knowledge. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for being here. I'm gon we're going to open this with a, a short presentation from uh, Sartro uh, because they are the central authority in this. They will play uh, three roles in the implementation of the, the directive. And uh, Christian will go through what the directive the directive goals are, what companies have to do, and uh, how we will assert uh, support them. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Christian Driga. I'm a, a counselor uh, in the uh, cooperation department at uh, Sergio. And uh, let's get started. So, our panel current challenges of cybersecurity policy and legislations and legislation. Um, actually, uh, regulating uh, uh, cybersecurity is a huge challenge, not only for the um, uh, legislative bodies, but also for the um, industries and uh, those who are uh, called to apply it. So, um, especially because in real life, when you want to protect the citizens, you appeal to emergency services, police, and military. If you want the same in the cyber world, uh, things get a lot more complicated, uh, especially because the whole uh, cyberspace is actually uh, a landscape which comprises uh, n nothing from the physical world, but uh, it comprises uh, services, providers, um, software uh, running uh, in a certain way. And this, all this makes the digital landscape in, in which uh, we uh, act. So, in, in cyber life, you need also um, awareness, self-protection, and the uh, responsibility of all the uh, actors involved. Main challenges in regulating uh, come from the fast changing landscape because all this can change from one day to another and cyber threats and uh, uh, technologies evolve very fast. Transposing this in a law which actually can be applied is uh, especially challenging. And uh, to give you a, an example, in 2000, when the um, Convention on Cybercrime was issued and adopted, um, we defined then um, information systems in a certain way. Today, everything around us is information systems, which uh, makes uh, it makes it very difficult for authorities to defend every Internet of thing, Things um, device and intervene if they were hacked or um, they, are, uh, they led to uh, damages. You also need a multidisciplinary approach 
not only uh, legal specialists, but uh, uh, technology specialists and uh, in uh, cybersecurity, cybersecurity specialists. And to make it even harder, if you issue a regulation which does not take into account the businesses, um, the way uh, things go on, uh, on the digital life, uh, you, may, you are in danger to uh, actually um, killing, uh, let's say so, um, the digital society. So simply mapping into a law known processes from real life is uh, close to impossible if you do not take into account the specifics of the digital landscape and the digital life. As a core gu guidelines, you have to um, start from the principles you want, set durable and strong principles, then develop broad definitions because they evolve very fast, notions which you use, um, identify uh, all the processes and things that change and developed for them in a law um, processes that uh, can uh, ensure upgrade of the law quickly than the uh, main uh, legal text and uh, then put uh, at the core of everything in uh, this domain uh, information sharing, cooperation, education because we all re rely on uh, self-awareness to actually get along with this uh, uh, new landscape in which we are, we are living. So, the EU directive is a continent-wide challenge to ensure uh, and create a unified cybersecurity preparedness and incident response uh, mechanism. So, challenges, as you see them listed on the slide, uh, vary from the differences between the capabilities uh, and preparedness of um, the member states to multiple services and activities which you want to protect, um, to standardization which is very fragmented, still very fragmented at EU level, um, to, and of course you need cooperation and unified practices to reach the unified uh, system and to regulate for the future. So, in a single slide, the NIS directive can be summed up like this. On the uh, European ecosystem, you, we have com the Commission, European Commission and the ENISA uh, as uh, regulatory bodies and uh, uh, together in, uh, with the cooperation group and the CERT network, which have to um, unify practices at EU level, uh, both in, uh, in regulating and also in uh, actual intervention and response to inc cyber incidents. On the other side, we have uh, national single points of contact through which uh, the uh, states should uh, interact in, uh, cyber, in NIS uh, related uh, matters and uh, alerts. Uh, and uh, at national levels, starting from the uh, NIS strategy, then uh, national uh, uh, legislation, which has to be transposed, um, the competent authorities, uh, CIR teams, and uh, of course the directive addresses to uh, operators of essential services and uh, digital service providers. So, actually the directive uh, in obliges the member states to adopt legal frameworks for, uh, and strategies and uh, designate competent authorities, uh, national, national CIR teams and single point of contact, identify in a period of time the operators of essential services and the essential services, impose the security and uh, incident response requirements and ensure e effective measures and application of the transposition, uh, transposing law. As you know, the Ministry of Communications and uh, Information Society has uh, um, issued a law proposal for um, uh, transposing the NIS directive. And, uh, in the following few slides, I will 
outline some of the uh, processes that uh, and were behind creating this uh, proposal and uh, the main uh, points of the proposal. So, aside from the deadline, which is May 19th, 2018, which uh, requires that we have a fully functional uh, legal framework, the adaptation of, to the national realities and um, creating a functional system both internally and also as a part of the EU uh, system. Um, the team also had uh, in mind to ensure uh, the longevity of the law because everything, given the fast evolution of uh, the digital landscape, and uh, also to provide adequate resources for this and uh, encouraging the cybersecurity um, market and uh, to uh, make uh, all actors involved to be responsible on their um, actions and uh, in applying the law. So, the NIS uh, transposition uh, proposal uh, designates the National Computer Emergency Response Team as um, Authori main authority in uh, NIS and uh, as point of contact and national CERT team. Um, essential services operators registry is uh, mainly the list which will be built up uh, with the uh, operators that are identified uh, according to this uh, law proposal. Um, the authority will establish uh, security and notification requirements um, through subsequent uh, legislation and acts uh, issued by the authority so that the, uh, they can be adapted uh, and issued new uh, versions uh, according to the evolution of uh, uh, situation. Um, of course, the project uh, has also cooperation mechanisms and uh, a mechanism to ensure the compliance with the with this uh, law proposal. To in to um, encourage the cybersecurity market, the law uh, the proposal has um, some provisions only for a certain type of services because first of all you cannot uh, identify and uh, put into a, regulate all the services. And uh, second, because um, you want to uh, leave the market uh, free to uh, evolve. So um, the law proposes uh, sec sector and uh, wide search and uh, um, private uh, C -cert, uh, services which require authorization uh, in order to keep them up to date with the evolution that occurs in uh, application of the law. Um, so also the security audit for the operators of essential services and for the um, uh, digital service providers uh, subject to the law are, um, are required uh, in the, from the same reason, for the same reason to uh, have um, to be um, authorized by the by the authority. The processes in the in the project uh, the, in the propo law proposal are uh, start from the incident notification, which for uh, uh, is done to the um, national CIR te team. Uh, immediately after they are discovered, we know that. Um, an intruder can be in the network of uh, an entity up to 200 days before it is uh, uh, the intrusion is discovered. So, um, at least you want to be, uh, receive the notification in time to be able to actually act at the uh, national level. We envisioned a um, service like similar to uh, 112 or 911 service, like 
where the imp uh, incidents are evaluated and the corresponding authorities which can intervene are alerted and also um, the other member states which may be impacted are also alerted and um, the CSER team at national level would uh, provide uh, guidance in manage managing the incident and would uh, cooperate with the, with the other authorities. Also, the law has some precaution measures taken, starting from the confidentiality of notifications and uh, of the information provided uh, to the authority, which are the, actually the base for uh, also for the um, cybersecurity services in, uh, in real life. Uh, are ensured uh, also in this uh, law proposal. Standardization uh, is uh, done by going through uh, using uh, internationally accepted standards uh, and uh, the NISA recommendations so that uh, um, so that um, a unified system can be reached also at uh, European level. And cooperation, of course, is the basis for uh, everything in this um, uh, transposal of the, the directive. All in one, um, and to sum it up, actually, when you read the directive, you initially see, you think you can transpose it quite easily. But aside from the uh, technology you have to take into account and the evolutions and the landscape, when you actually start making a law out of it, you go to such diagrams and uh, um, so starting simple, actually you end up with processes and uh, um, a lot of uh, things to take into account. This would be it for now. Okay, thank, thank you. And I hope that, that puts things into perspective and clarifies a bit what the, the, the law tries to achieve. Um, I'm gonna go now to the uh, legislative part of the, <laughs> uh, because the law has to, uh, the proposal has to become law by, by May 9th, and also it has to be accompanied by all of the technical documents and uh, norms that describe what does minimum security requirements mean exactly, what are the, the thresholds where you are considered a critical services operator, uh, and what are the certification plans for auditors and things like that, certification requirements for auditors. Um, and do you think, do you ex when do you expect this to be finalized, given the the normal legislative process where it has to go through commissions and then through both chambers and, and so forth. And do you think it leaves enough time to companies to prepare? And also if you have any already based on this proposal, if you have ideas that for changes that you're gonna propose during the legislative process. Thank you. Um, first let me let me clarify a little bit what the roles are uh, in the Romanian uh, legislative uh, institutional framework. Um, I'm the head of the IT committee in the Romanian Chamber of Deputies, which is the lower house of the parliament, uh, but also on matters uh, of IT is the, uh, the decisive chamber. So. Um, so in terms of transposition of uh, European directives and actually a lot of the, the legislation in a given sector, um, perhaps in a, in a somewhat unexpected fashion or a, a bizarre twist of things, it's actually the executive body in Romania that does most of the legislative work. Um, what's, what happens for directives is that usually the ministries in the corresponding sector or, or the authorities, uh, such as CERT, uh, they draft uh, a law which is then submitted to the parliament and, and indeed the decision and amendments and, and so on uh, uh, happen in the parliament committees and uh, eventually in the plenary session. Um, so in terms of, uh, of a calendar, 
Uh, this rests mostly with the government um, at the current stage that I'm not a member of, but maybe uh, our colleague can tell us a little bit more. Uh, at the current stage, the, the law has not been adopted by the government as an official proposal. So that's the first step. That's when the formal process of the law uh, begins. Uh, I don't know when, when that date is going to be, but at that point, it comes into the parliament and then we discuss it. Um, also, in terms of the specifics, uh, as you mentioned, all, all the uh, further legislation, that uh, definitely also rests with the government, like the secondary and, and tertiary legislation, which defines the nitty-gritty details of the implementation. Um, in terms of where our responsibilities really are, uh, they begin when, when this project is submitted to the parliament. Um, and what we will do for sure is to organize uh, some serious debates um, because we have some concerns about how this uh, law is um, about the draft. We think it's a good project, both the directive. Uh, uh, we think it's urgent because, as you, as you mentioned, there's a deadline there. Um, but the Romanian administration is, is very good at, at transforming ev anything into red tape and bureaucracy. <laughs> So we, don't, we want this to, to really uh, improve the, the security of, uh, of the various systems that are essential for, for the country and not to become just uh, you know, more, um, more bureaucracy and, and more permitting and, and another level of headaches for, for, for actors in the field. In that sense, I think it's essential uh, that s several principles are, are built into the law. Transparency, which I think there is somewhat a lack of in, in some respects. Um, an emphasis on cooperation between stakeholders. Um, usually the Romanian system of responsibility is very centralized. You go to this authority, you get the permit, you, you get uh, authorized to do things and, and, and so on. Um, and I think there, there's also uh, an, another concern that I've, I found in the law is that uh, the, the, the central authority can be financed through the fines that it levies. I think there may be a conflict of interest there. Like you might be, um, uh, there might be an incentive. Overreach to overreach to uh, issue fines just to get a budget. Yes. Uh, there's also the concern of, of uh, the, there, there's a lot to do for the central body and I don't envy you, I don't want to be, <laughs> we don't want to be in your shoes. Uh, it's, it's very centralized, there's a lot of roles and I'm worried about uh, the capacity, uh, about w whether there will be capacity issues, whether you will have the right resources to, to implement all of these, these roles and responsibilities. Um, that all, all of that being said, those, those concerns, uh, we, we are fully supportive and, and uh, we will do our role. We will have the public debate in the parliament, which has the final say on the form of the law. So amendments can be brought in, um, concerns can be raised, and um, we, will, we will open up to, to a very serious debate with all stakeholders uh, in the parliament when, when this law reaches us. Okay, when thank this you. this law proposal. I have a question for the audience. Can, by, by raise of hand, <coughs> Can you raise your hand if you are in a leadership role in your organization, like management and things like that? Okay. And how many of your organizations do you think are going to fall under this, uh, this directive, which includes essential service providers and also digital service providers in the context that they offer services to essential service providers? Okay. Um, yeah, if you want to, to respond to some of the I issues. would uh, I would like to to add something to um, what my colleague said. Uh, first of all, uh, the uh, draft uh, proposal the proposal was not uh, developed by us as uh, an authority. It, it is the Ministry of uh, uh, Communications I Initiative, and there was a working group comprising of uh, uh, many of the uh, many institutions and. Uh, other ministries. Um, second, um, in the interest of uh, keeping this panel not too long, um, of course, we d uh, I didn't go through the principles and uh, the uh, 
um, the part that uh, would uh, address some of the uh, concerns uh, raised here, but uh, uh, the transposal of the directive uh, means also transposing the principles from the directive and also the precautions uh, taken there. Uh, all in one, uh, uh, the public consultation uh, period pr prior to sending this uh, uh, project to the um, to the other ministries and then to be adopted uh, and forwarded by the government to to the parliament um, is uh, still ongoing. So uh, we there is also time for input uh, and. Uh, for improvement, it is uh, only the initial draft that uh, to get to get things things start started, uh, as we also have the deadline on uh, May 19, 2018. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, because this this directive, this law will also cover uh, essential services in the public sector, and we have the government CIO here. Uh, what is the government's take on this and its role in identifying its own essential services and uh, the requirements of this legislation? Is the government prepared or the public institutions, are, are they prepared to respond to such incidents and comply, to comply with this legislation? Um, well, it's, I, I think it's too early to, um, hello everybody, first of all. Uh, I think it's too early to, to talk about uh, preparedness as long as we don't have uh, even the initial draft uh, finalized. Um, I'm um, more concerned about the, the technical aspects and the nitty gritty stuff uh, because those will be uh, actually governing uh, the way that uh, public authorities will uh, implement and will cooperate with the, the CERT team to uh, make sure that the directive uh, has very strong roots in, uh, um, and the principles are being uh, um, uniformly adopted. Um, so uh, from my point of view, I think uh, we are uh, um, probably two to three months uh, away from uh, getting uh, more technical input uh, from ENISA and other European bodies that are uh, covering the secondary and tertiary uh, levels of uh, the legislation, uh, which will uh, uh, give us more input on the uh, specific technical aspects that we need to, to cover in the future. Um, one, uh, one initiative was um, uh, that uh, we are still fighting for is related to creating a government agency uh, to handle the, the governmental cloud. And not only that, but uh, for the technical aspects of uh, public administration. And that incorporates uh, an initiative to have a uh, sectorial CERT uh, or CERT team for uh, the entire public administration. And uh, I was looking at this opportunity to, to have uh, some sort of a pilot um, of, um, uh, of a sectorial CERT and how it would co cooperate with, uh, with the CERT raw team in order to implement the, the NIST directive. So uh, we will see how uh, things are evolving. Uh, both in terms of uh, the legislation and uh, these uh, these other initiatives, um, another uh, another optic on uh, on the whole uh, process is that uh, security has been compliance driven uh, for several years now, and uh, uh, we see this uh, European initiative aligning itself a little bit uh, to the U.S. initiatives in terms of. Uh, putting more um, uh, formats out there for companies to, to be able to um, properly address the, the IT security uh, issues. Uh, there isn't uh, still, um, to, to this day, there isn't uh, um, uh, enough awareness, uh, and uh, even if uh, this has been built up by compliance in the US, I think in um, Europe and uh, specifically in Romania, we still don't have the level of awareness at uh, the CEO level um, that will allow us to, to make the proper investments in IT security. We don't comprehend uh, well the risks that the uh, companies are uh, um, uh, facing. Uh, so that compliance is one, uh, one way of um, uh, putting more, um, um, more, yeah, 
more action and uh, more defining uh, better the, the space, at least for those uh, uh, important uh, information systems that are critical to, to society. And a lot of those are in public administration, but with the NIST directive, we see a, a bit of a shift towards uh, uh, the private sector and uh, maybe the banks, hospitals, and other uh, uh, companies dealing with a lot of uh, people, airports uh, could be part of, uh, of uh, this uh, sector defined as um, uh, essential services operators. Okay. Do, do you expect in terms of budget, do you expect new budget requirements f for the public institutions because they will have to comply with this, so we'll have the, they will have to allocate resources, they will have to uh, uh, externalize some services, obviously, uh, contracts, external services, if they don't have in-house uh, specialization. Definitely. Uh, but again, we need to look at uh, the technical uh, specifications of the law, and then we will understand the types of technologies that we need to implement. It's uh, similar to GDPR. There has been a lot of noise on uh, implementing uh, um, uh, this regulation as well. Uh, it, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, technology solutions that are covering parts of the GDPR process, and it will be the same with the uh, NIST directive. There are also a lot of uh, processes that need to, to change with, uh, with the companies so that uh, uh, these regulations, and, uh, the regulation and the directive are being um, uh, respected. So um, um, well definitely the, it will be a new security market, and again, it's part of the uh, compliance-driven security market, not uh, awareness-driven and or risk-based uh, driven. Um, and uh, we are aligning ourselves a little bit to, to the U.S. market from this, uh, from this point of view. We will still have probably more regulation in the healthcare industry, like uh, we know it's in the U.S. and uh, um, other, other areas. But uh, this is a very strong step in uh, addressing critical systems and how they should be protected and how the incidents should be reported so that everybody is aware of, uh, of a problem. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to also get the view from, from the civil society's point of view in terms of transparency because the, the law has some stipulations that the data is confidential and obviously these are we're talking about the public institution and, and the government and they represent the, the citizens and the citizens in interest should be served ultimately here and citizens have a right to know when a, 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 an incident happened because of a cyber attack and impacted their lives they they suffered the power outage or uh, hospital systems were down or they didn't get their their water and things like that <coughs> thank you um, thank you for the invitation. Um, first, before I answer your question, and I add a few more that I think that are interesting for the public, I have to say that the proposal is not that bad. However, the last time when we talked about the cybersecurity bill, and we were very much against it because it provided access to computer system by the secret services without a warrant, which actually was turned down by the Constitutional Court. Um, so that was very bad. This is not that bad. This is improvable. However, it appears that the idea that we'll get an, uh, 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 a much larger cybersecurity bill is not um, over. So I see this as an opportunity to discuss about principle of cybersecurity that might apply also to other sectors as well in the future. Um, so on, on this perspective, there are, I listed four points, but I add also the transparency one that I think it needs to be considered by the public. Um, and I'll, I'll put the transparency at last, not because it's not important, but I think there are other issues that are more pressing for the, for the current audience. First, the current proposal establishes a system of authorization of security auditors and CERT teams. And the European Union Directive does not include that. So basically what CERT does, it says, if you want to do any kind of security audit, to the companies that are under this regulation or CERT teams, you need to pass through some kind of authorization system that we create and we establish the rules. And by the way, we also take the fees for that, which will become part of our budget. So um, this is a very strict regime, which basically creates a new business or a new um, profession um, that is regulated. And what we've seen also in other fields, but also in the field of physical security, is that this has been hijacked by um, other interests than, than the market. Uh, 
Um, and also what, at least in the current format, uh, does it excludes any foreigner um, uh, cybersecurity expert to be able to, to do these audits. Um, so we think that uh, the, the solution that the government is currently proposing is wrong, uh, and they should either have a free regime, so, so where actually, for example, the bank that wants to do the audit decides who is capable of doing the audit on their own system, uh, or in the worst case scenario to, to include some kind of simple notification system where you just notify the CERT on what kind of, of uh, auditors you want to use. The second thing is the um, sanctionatory regime. So I think that CERT should very much focus, and I think they try to do that, on cooperation and partnership with the, with the private sector. However, the current uh, proposal actually has fines which are up to 5% of the turnover of a company, which is huge if the company has more than 2 million uh, lay. C can I ask a question yeah. here? Because isn't this, uh, isn't this because of, uh, if you have some fines, the, the value-based fines and not the percentage-based fines, uh, for some companies they might be uh, a lot. For multinational companies, there might be nothing, well, right? I, I and then you need to have a percentage type of uh, fine so that you can put pressure on the multinational companies who can afford paying the small fines and they don't, they, they wouldn't otherwise care because when it's a, it's a part, it's a percentage of their revenue, then it matters. Well, I think you need to look at the profit margins in every sector. But I know a lot of sectors, including the essential services, when the profit margins are very low, it's like one or two percent of the turnover. So if you suddenly have one potential five or five percent of the turnover, that means your profit for five years. I think that's huge. And it's again, it's not a problem that, um, um, I mean, I, I agree with the principle that it should be a, a percentage of the turnover, but I disagree with the amount. I think that 5% is, is really big, and we see the danger, and we saw in other line of businesses in the Romanian society, that sometimes when the government needs some cash, they do this, and they go with fines, and especially with 5% of the turnover, I, that's a very big amount. That's can, that can bring a business uh, a, a company uh, out of uh, business. Um, just to, to finish the, the other points, the third point that I wanted to raise, and I think that's also important, what, what the current draft law doesn't tell you is the fact that uh, when you inform the third on, um, on uh, uh, incident notification, uh, even though they have in the law an obligation of confidentiality, they might not exonerate themselves from obligations to report to the law enforcement authorities. So, and this is a very tricky subject, it's, it's general, it's not just with, with, this, with this directive, but, um, but this is a very critical issue, in my opinion, and they should have a, a very clear policy on how they treat the incidents that are reported to them in relationship with other law enforcement authorities or with other authorities, such as the Data Protection uh, Authority. The fourth point is related to the fact that, according to the current draft law, they may do um, um, unannounced controls, including getting documents on any registries, financial documents, commercial documents, and any other kind of documents or acts, which is a lot, and it, it looks more like it's a law enforcement body than a cybersecurity one. Uh, and then the, the, the last point would be the transparency one. Um, the, the current draft uh, foresees that uh, basically all notifications are not are exempted from the from the uh, public document status. So that would also mean that you might not get some kind of uh, statistical information uh, or companies might misuse that in order not to make public uh, certain incidents that they don't want you to be aware of, even though there is a public interest in order to do this. And uh, this is something that we've also discussed yesterday during the official public debate at the ministry. Um, so there, we, we got some answers from the... Uh, I have a feeling you, you want to address some of this point. <laughs> so many questions in a, in a row. Um, I will need uh, uh, Bogdan's help to uh, remember them. 
and to address them. Uh, first of all, um, yesterday was one uh, public meeting uh, the, and debate at the Ministry of uh, Communications. Uh, we uh, received uh, and uh, the Ministry will take in consider into consideration uh, all the uh, suggestions. Uh, and uh, of course, um, feedback from, uh, from the market is, uh, is welcomed so that uh, this law actually, uh, this law proposal actually gets uh, better. It's uh, improvable, of course, but um, getting to the points uh, which Bogdan mentioned, um, first of them, um, the authorization regime. Actually, uh, the problem which we also see in our, uh, uh, often in our society is that uh, um, audits and uh, some other um, similar activities uh, do not keep the pace with the actual evolution of the um, of the real real life uh, landscape. So um, the mechanism for author uh, authorizing uh, auditors uh, was um, conceived. Uh, um, as a need to uh, ensure that uh, by uh, the evolution of technology, threats, and so on in a year, two, or five years from now on, uh, somehow we ensure that the uh, audit mechanism also upgrades, the audits also upgrade. Uh, this was the starting point. Um, of course, uh, uh, the main proposal um, actually uh, tries to define a general um, framework <coughs> uh, for um, which will be um, will have subsequent legislation uh, that will uh, have uh, will take into consideration uh, everything that uh, we have to uh, comply with coming from the European Union including recognition of uh, um, certifications and um, uh, of the auditors uh, authorized in other states. Um, but uh, um, suggestions on how to improve the actual text are, are, are welcome. Um, Do you, I have a quick one. Delete those articles. <laughs> Before we go to the other points, and I'll let you go to the other points, uh, I want to ask our other panelists if they have something to add to, to this this particular issue of, of requiring, creating basically a regulated profession of auditors that need to be certified here, because in, in, in my view, if you have like a multinational company that has branches in different countries where this legislation will be implemented in some form or another, and they get like a, a contract with a, an auditor for all of their branches, it means that auditor needs to be authorized in Romania. I mean, if, if every country would have a, a stipulation like this, a requirement like this, then a company would either have to hire auditors in each country or go to, to an auditor who is uh, accredited or uh, um, in, in all countries. So that, that kind of poses a problem. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I think those are, those are very, uh, legitimate concerns. Uh, I'm also worried about, uh, you know, creating artificial businesses. Uh, we've, we've done that a bunch in Romania previously with many other, um, you know, auditing kind of uh, jobs, like, you know, there's uh, the environmental thing where, where there are questions um, and, and others. Um, I, I, I don't think we should, uh, you know, a, a lot of this law a little bit sounds that if, if if put into action the wrong way, uh, we could create kind of, um, and this is not translatable, but a sanepid, uh, a health authority that you, everybody's scared of. They will come and fine you, they will take 5%, which I agree is, is, is ridiculous, and, and that definitely won't pass, uh, won't pass the parliament, 5% uh, of turnover. Um, or at least nobody in their right mind would vote for that. Um, it's enormous I, by by any I mean the the margin of profit I mean uh, is, is less than that for for a lot of businesses so so I'm 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 
I'm very skeptical it, it's, it's a good idea to, to create this kind of regula regulated new, uh, uh, new, new type of, of um, uh, consultant, right? Um, I, I think that would not, uh, that would only serve to create uh, bureaucracy and hurdles for, for the businesses and would not really help with, with what the directive actually aims at, which is improving security. Uh, just uh, a small comment as well. Um, related to auditors, um, I, I tend to agree that uh, over uh, regulating this uh, may be a problem. I think there are um, auditing bodies uh, with uh, international reach that uh, uh, can be uh, mentioned as being supported or uh, um, exactly. I would uh, I would rather put more focus. Um, um, from uh, from the regulation side on uh, the awareness part, um, and I would, uh, for example, I would ask the auditors to formally present the report to CERT uh, from those entities. There won't be uh, hundreds or thousands of entities, so uh, it could be, a, for example, a process that uh, each entity would uh, then uh, um, need to present their plan and uh, support uh, their actions in the future. In the end, uh, the, the final goal is to, to have a more secure um, operator, not uh, uh, not just uh, you know showing them the stick, or other ways. For example, uh, putting together the template of the report and uh, specifying exactly the the types of actions that you want to to get out of uh, that report, and make sure that even the even if the the auditor is not of the best quality, they still need to produce the results that you're interested in. So formalizing a little bit of this, but not uh, um, uh, putting, a, um, I don't know, a new, a new type of business into the market uh, could be a better approach to this. Thank you. Do we have, do we have microphones in the audience? Okay. Well, if some of you has questions related to this, we're gonna take uh, one or two questions, depends on, okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Mikhail Gorash. Um, I would have a question for uh, Mr. Drula and Bogdan Manola. How would you say it would be best to ensure that uh, the uh, auditors are doing their job? Because at uh, this point, what the directive says is that the national authority is responsible for increasing uh, the cybersecurity and also when it comes to creating audits, you please keep in mind that there are a lot of audits in all areas of activity, even the banking sector, and they're all checkboxes. So the difference between let's do a checkbox and let's be sure that these guys really know what they're talking about, that they are up to speed, that they know the latest developments, how would you ensure that unless you have a way of um, checking that expertise. Thank you. I'm going to add to that because uh, we've seen uh, in other, it's a, a very good question and one that I also had in mind. Uh, we've seen other sectors when you put these requirements in place that the focus shifts from actual prevention and real world measures to compliance and, and formalizing like a checklist of we've done this and this and this and, and not on actual uh, on actual prevention, and we've seen uh, in the in the payment card industry uh, many cases of data breaches at organizations that were PCI compliant at at the moment of the breach. So th that means that those organizations had passed an audit, and that's that showed that everything was fine and they were compliant with the PCI standards, yet they were still breached. And I'd like to also ask what happened what happens in, in those cases if, if a, a serv in, in this context, if a service provider is breached while the audit showed that it was okay and they were, they were fine? Uh, are they still penalized in some way? Are they still susceptible to, f to fines or they, they get a clean slate? Um, to answer the last one, probably. Currently, no, they're not 
subject to fines. However, it depends on the contract. So here it depends on what, because this is a contract between two private parties well, in most of the cases. So it's the contract between, for example, a bank and an auditor. So it depends what it says there that the auditor should do and what's their responsibility during the process, including a responsibility for not performing their job too well. So that's, that's possible, but that's a private deal between companies. Um, and, and to answer to, to Mirchad's question first, I, th I don't think that on authorization regime would uh, actually give this benefit to the, comp to the, to the people that are, uh, um, I mean, you will not get necessarily bet uh, better auditors. Um, I know examples from other lines of industries that try to do that. So there are a number of industries that try to get uh, continuous uh, professional education. Uh, and what it turns out in the end is just another line of business of uh, companies that either do trainings for low money or uh, they only give you the certificate without being present of the training. So uh, this may happen in any line of business and the authorization doesn't necessarily solve this problem. However, what it might create is, is the problem of a very um, closed, uh, maybe elite, uh, uh, elite uh, group that actually uh, does not permit innovation or new people coming from the outside. And in all the cases of regulated professions in Romania that I know, and I know a few, uh, this is what is happening. Um, and uh, also what I want to say, what would be the, the solution? I think the, the solution would be not to focus on the person, but to focus on the report, as it was uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, because if you, if you accredit a person, doesn't necessarily mean that they will do a good job. It just depends on their own persona and ethics and how they relate to the, to the companies. On the other hand, we should also look at the free market tools. So ideally, if uh, an auditor doesn't do their job properly, they will not be called back by the same company or by uh, a sister company. Or maybe there is, a, um, um, let's say, uh, internal um, sectorial group that, that uh, has a, a list. Also, what CERC could do would, uh, could also try and, um, and have a system of um, uh, grading those people that did the audits. You know, but it's not something ex ante. It's not to put a, 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 a barrier before entering into a market. Okay, That's so may I have a small intervention yeah. now? Here, again, me, Mirja, here. Uh, so what you're actually saying is uh, CERTRO as a national authority should be responsible because what, this is what the directive says on increasing the level of cybersecurity in Romania, and yet should have no means of certifying uh, anyone who could do an audit, pretty much changes nothing. And also, how would you feel if you were to be responsible for something like that? And please bear in mind that we're talking about essential uh, service operators and um, um, uh, uh, Digital, service, Digital service. service. Digital service providers, sorry. So, pretty much essential service operators are a uh, critical infrastructure, and nobody said about anything about how these auditors would uh, be in the market. So, pretty much what you're trying to uh, insinuate now is that uh, we're going to create a new job, a new just description, a new job description, but there is no such thing right now in any text. And let's be serious about it. This is just like fear talking. Uh, it's obvious that everyone could have an opportunity to take a, an exam, to be an open job, instead of having uh, experts like the Ministry of Justice experts that were there only because they lined up and signed up for a list. And yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you took the Ministry of Justice. That's a very good example on how things do not work. But first, so the directive... Please, please don't be the judge and executioner before no, no, no. the actual text no, 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 is no, no. up so, and gone. So first, yeah. the directive has one sentence when they mention qualified auditor. It's in Article 15. The rest is up to the member state. So it's up to each state to decide what is the policy in this regime. So it's nothing that the directive 
uh, imposes that you should use a system of certification or authorization of, of uh, auditors. Second, the system that you mentioned, the justice system, uh, with legal IT experts is the best example of things that do not work. So currently in Romania, in order to present yourself in front of a judge as an IT, IT expert, you need to be on a list which is approved by the Ministry of Justice and you need to pass a test in front of a Ministry of Justice team, which knows nothing about IT and IT security. So what turns out into is that we have five people on the list so in all the trials in Romania, in Bucharest at least, you need to appeal to one of these five persons that they have a certain age and they haven't been renewed and no IT, good IT expert is actually incentivized in order to, to go on this list. So this is a perfect example of closed business that doesn't work and actually it, it creates more problem for the justice system because the judge is reluctant to accept an IT expert which is not on the list. How does the third uh, role uh, um, way of auditing or certifying auditors work? Okay, but let's not yeah. turn this into a conversation. Let, let, let's let I, the panelists answer first. I would like to, to add something uh, to this. Uh, um, first of all, the directive says, uh, gives the option to, for the member states to uh, actually uh, check if the uh, operators are compliant with the law in two ways. One of them is by the authority doing the actual audit, which means uh, going to the actual infrastructure of the operator or the service provider, getting into checking their systems, seeing their data and so on, which raises other um, problems um, in uh, our uh, society, or uh, uh, use um, auditors from the from, from the market, uh, and uh, the group that developed the uh, law proposal uh, took the second uh, um, option, so that the the authority um, the would be authority would have only the option to appeal to the to the market so the next problem raised uh, in the discussions was okay but how do you ensure that uh, uh, the control you which you have to do as an authority is actually effective in this case and uh, an auditor would not just uh, pass as everything okay in that infrastructure and then you have uh, an incident which can lead, for instance, at the hospital, at the death uh, of uh, some uh, patients in the emergency uh, service, uh, like uh, it was about to happen with uh, uh, the attacks in uh, the spring in the UK, for instance. So you need an, an, an efficient uh, compliance uh, uh, control mechanism, and uh, but also we have our uh, local Romanian uh, challenges in, uh, in, um, in this. So um, this is why actual input uh, and uh, feedback and, uh, we have, uh, is, is needed and we, we have to find the, the best safeguards also that, that would ensure that the, uh, the law is, um, is transposing the directive and we, we will have a system which will function. The conclusion is that it's, it's an open question and there's obviously room for improvement and if you are interested in participating, obviously try to participate in the public debates and send your proposals and they will be taken into consideration both during the, the ministry phase of, of drafting the legislation and during the, the parliament phase. And uh, I'd like to change the topic a bit because we could talk about auditors and, and uh, details all day long. But in, in my point of view, this cre the legislation creates a few opportunities, business opportunities, right? Aside from the auditors, uh, you also, uh, cert, cert row will not function as a traditional uh, cert. It will not come into your company and help you, actually help you respond to a security incident. They will offer guidance, they will offer coordination, but you will ha have to either have an internal cert or you'll have to uh, externalize that and contract from, from a company that specializes in, in incident response and computer forensics and all, and all of that. 
so this creates an opportunity for for businesses and probably good news for many of you here who work in security companies. Uh, on the other hand, it also there's also a skills shortage in our industry, and this puts even more pressure because now. Uh, public institutions and uh, companies will will go out looking to hire security personnel, uh, security uh, IT personnel specializes in IT security for their internal needs, and they will compete with security companies who already uh, hire professionals in this field and offer very attractive salaries. So it will be very difficult. Uh, so my question is, uh, starting from that part of the panel, uh, if there are any initiatives or programs with academia and uh, uh, training centers to uh, specialize more people in cybersecurity, because there will obviously be a need for it, uh, also with GDPR, which is also coming, so it will also create a need in public institutions and the private sector for more uh, security practitioners. Uh, and also it creates an opportunity, it's a related question, creates an opportunity for, and this hasn't been mentioned a lot, for the cybersecurity insurance market, which is underdeveloped in Europe, and probably, I don't, I don't even know if it exists in Romania, because companies could offset some of those, those costs uh, that, that they incur in case of a breach, and they have to respond, they have to hire an external company, they have to notify the public in case of GDPR, uh, um, legal assistance and all that, and all that costs money, and at least in the United States there are insurance packages specialized uh, for incident response that could limit the, the, lo the losses suffered by a company, whereas in Europe, cybersecurity insurance is kind of packaged with the traditional insurance for damage, for fire, for accidents, for things like that, so um, is there, are there any initiatives to encourage this new market segment of cybersecurity insurance and are there any challenges there? I mean, um, I think that's a, that's a, that's a better question uh, in terms of the initiatives um, for, for the people in the executive role on, on security. We're definitely supportive of that and, and I think your question and, and the previous discussion uh, raises uh, a few things that, that, that I want to address. Um, I think, you know, increasing the security uh, is in a company's best interest. You don't need the state to follow your best interest for you. You know, it, it's a fallacy. I mean, it doesn't work like that. Uh, you, you can't have some centralized body responsible for the security of, of uh, critical infrastructure, whether in the public or, or private domain. It has. Um, you know that there's there needs to be an, a level of self-regulation uh, of the industry. Uh, you could have um, you could have this uh, permitting authorization uh, system and, and still uh, have it be a checkbox or a rubber stamp. And you know we we have the example of road safety. There was another European directive for road safety auditors starting in 2008. Do you know how many auditors there were uh, authorized in Romania until last year? Twelve. Um, and, and most of them were bad, um, and, and the road safety hasn't improved. So uh, I think the, the role of, of the central authority goes uh, beyond being a whip that uh, ensures you have good security. Um, it's, it's also ab about awareness, uh, about, like you mentioned, uh, you know, training programs, um, about creating a framework where, where things can be left uh, to the market and the actors that are um, for sure will follow their, their best interest because nobody wants to be breached. Well, the, uh, the insurance market, it's, uh, it's a tough question and uh, even in the US, um, I, haven't seen, um, I haven't seen it implemented in a way that uh, companies would not uh, have security measures and uh, uh, so uh, it, uh, it, it helps at some point, but uh, it doesn't uh, uh, take security off the table for a corporation. Right, but it creates an incentive to implement security because then You're you right. can buy cybersecurity insurance. You're right. Um, it's, um, uh, on the other hand, it's not applicable on critical infrastructure and the NIST directive because we're talking about human lives and uh, there is no insurance that can cover that. Uh, you need to do all the uh, preemptive security that you can 
in order to ensure that uh, the failure of your systems is not putting uh, in danger uh, uh, lives or uh, the, uh, the well-being of, uh, of citizens or patients or uh, customers in any, in, in any form. So uh, I, I don't see insurance in this market. But, but uh, you there will a fine. I mean, you can't put a price on human life. I mean, well, the, the, the fine actually uh, uh, enforces uh, the regulation and in the, uh, puts pressure on the irresponsible companies to make sure that they are doing all they can uh, and they do the proper investments to ensure that uh, those uh, incidents are not likely to, uh, to happen. Uh, so uh, the investment is into more preemptive uh, and into more prevention of uh, incidents rather than uh, uh, doing forensic afterwards, right? So um, it, it's a tough subject, but uh, as I said before, I don't think it's uh, largely applicable to, to NIST and critical infrastructure. It is more of a um, um, SMB market uh, initiative if, uh, or for even for large enterprises for specific systems if it's uh, more appropriate. So more uh, applicable to GDPR maybe? Probably yes, probably yes, because that doesn't uh, take into consideration um, 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 a lot of bad things. I mean, Yahoo has all the passwords already out, right? So what can be worse than that? Uh, and nobody died off of that, right? So it's, it's bad having uh, PII, personally identifiable information out in the public, but um, the it's quantifiable. Exactly, it's but uh, if you leave, uh, uh, um, we don't need to get into examples. Um, the skills shortage. How the skill shortage. <laughs> Another good question. Uh, the skill shortage, it's, um, um, it was one of the focus that uh, I was trying to, uh, to get a grip on. Um, in, uh, in the Romanian uh, education system, but it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy because we don't have teachers. Uh, we don't have the setup that allows us to be flexible with new technologies. Uh, all the setup that we have in education actually brings with it a lot of inertia and uh, brings with it exactly the opposite of what we need in uh, the IT world, um, uh, being able to teach about blockchain uh, the year after it came out in the market and uh, be able to, to be very flexible with new technologies so that we adopt and we innovate at a very early stage. Um, we have a lot of master's degrees, so we do have some specialization in, uh, um, in IT security. Uh, some, uh, uh, I see some universities even with uh, six uh, to 10 programs of masters. Um, um, there is some uh, movement in, um, on what's a mental dual, uh, dual education, which is uh, formally known as professional schools or industrial schools. So um, there may be ways to, to um, um, identify skills uh, for people that would like to remain in the IT or development work or uh, security uh, in uh, whatever used to be a, um, um, a very dedicated workforce type of uh, high school. So we can, uh, we can uh, try some pilots and uh, have some schools like that in Bucharest or in the IT centers in the country and see how uh, that is uh, turning out uh, in the end. Um, that's about it. Uh, we see uh, and, uh, another initiative that I had is actually moving a lot of um, 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 uh, moving a program, an IT dedicated program to high school and even lower uh, than high school. Uh, CERTRO has uh, some uh, good initiatives. They put together a uh, sanitization uh, movie uh, that is being shown in, uh, uh, in schools around the world so kids know how to use internet and Facebook and other web applications. Uh, so initiatives like this are think, uh, I think are very helpful at early stages and maybe even a more developed program later on would, uh, would help with uh, more awareness in terms of security. And dedicated schools will uh, actually help us address the skill set of the people that would like to remain in the industry, not just being aware of, uh, of the industry. Okay. Um, if, if you have something to add to, to these questions, and we can go to the, the second point raised by uh, Bogdan, the one regarding the level of the fines. 
Just to add um, about the programs uh, set up by CERTRO, uh, also uh, we have, uh, this was the second year of a uh, uh, cybersecurity course for journalists because uh, um, the media should uh, be able to um, reflect and uh, properly address uh, um, and communicate to the public the, what, what is actually going on and how the public should uh, uh, protect itself. And um, in general, um, we cannot uh, go with only one specialization. We need to, uh, technicians need to also be aware of the legal part of what they are doing, the implications of, on the, for instance, we, when you apply GDPR, you, you need to, to know the legal implications, the technical aspects, and so on. So uh, it would be desirable to, to see more uh, um, uh, programs that would uh, uh, develop, a, develop a multidisciplinary approach to, to, the, uh, to the training of uh, actual uh, uh, workers. Okay. And if you want to answer Bogdan's uh, other points about the, the level of fines, the transparency issue, and uh, and the law, enforc the law enforcement. Okay. okay. For uh, first of all, uh, regarding the level of fines, uh, the directive uh, clearly states that uh, the fines uh, that uh, could go to a level where they are dissuasive. So the actual uh, percentage from the um, turnover uh, of a company uh, as a as a principle you we see it also in the in gdpr the actual uh, figures these are to be decided uh, until the legislative process uh, uh, gone but it's an obligation uh, through the directive to also have such uh, fines uh, and in general to um, the the state the, the each member state uh, has the obligation to actually ensure that the NIS directive is applied effectively. So uh, any uh, other um, mechanisms uh, that we see in, uh, in uh, the uh, proposed uh, uh, law are actually uh, the bare minimum which could be identified from the, from the um, uh, directive with the, uh, with the exception of uh, what we've discussed today about the auditors, uh, simply because there was the other concern of, um, of having uh, uh, only formal audits uh, and uh, as a measure to ensure the uh, uh, compliance with, the, with the, this uh, directive. And uh, next, uh, Cooperation with law enforcement, or whether you have an obligation to report things to law enforcement and things like that. Well, um, by the Romanian law, there is this obligation. Uh, then, uh, um, of course, reporting to the to the law enforcement um, a crime is um, um, is mandatory. But um, in this uh, in this question, the problem is. Who actually is uh, is uh, the the part that commits the that, that breaks the law? Because if we if we are talking about the op uh, operators of essential services, uh, we um, first of all um, we uh, the obligation would be to to report. But on the other, from when the criminal is uh, the one who breached the the network of the operator of essential services, then um, reporting uh, is, uh, could be the, the obligation of the actual operator. Uh, the guidelines that CERT would uh, provide would also indicate uh, this. And, uh, well, maybe And the, do you want to address the transparency as well, like public reports, public notifications, 
uh, when the incident is large enough, will CERT come out and say, hey, this is what happened, and will there be uh, periodic yes. or annual reports, transparency yes. reports, this many incidents in these sectors? The directive has also uh, an article uh, stating that uh, the authority should uh, inform the public in, uh, in cases where uh, this would uh, uh, be uh, for administering, uh, would be useful for administering an, an incident. This is the part that we, for now, took in the, uh, the, the working group took into the, into the project, but uh, the uh, concerns uh, and the recommendations raised here on uh, actually communicating to the public also the, um, the statistics and the, um, uh, so, so that the public can take, uh, can, can learn something and take uh, proper measures to protect themselves. Well, this uh, actually is going on also right now in search role. Uh, this uh, will be uh, um, also included in, uh, in, the, in the text of the proposal that would be forwarded for adoption because um, otherwise without exchanging information, without providing information to the public and reports and so on and methods of attack and, uh, and vulnerabilities uh, newly discovered, and so on, you, uh, we, you cannot have cybersecurity. Right, I'm just saying because the public might want to know that the, the law is actually effective, or maybe other bodies of, of uh, the parliament might, is there parliamentary control over uh, the activity of, of third row? And because uh, if you see like a if you see like a report where you see there have been this many incidents this year, but very few fines, then you, you might you might wonder why that is, right? I mean, is, is, uh, uh, are these uh, requirements actually enforced or just the reporting and nothing happens, right? So, uh, I also like, because you are, don't have much time left, I'd like to take one or two, two questions from the audience. Microphones. Hello, I am Christian Mustace, Senior Integration Engineer, and I'm interested in fake news uh, concerning cybersecurity. How do you do not to spread the fake news by yourselves? And this is uh, regarding the attack on Astra Insurance Company, which from my point of view, it was a fake news. And it was present on your Facebook account. Okay, I, I'm not... I'm not sure if insurance companies fall under this legislation. If you want, if you want to, if you want to address it, maybe you can. But let's take another question, just so we have. I, I can answer that if you don't yeah. mind. Again, let's I work for Sertro, so you know okay. why. Uh, the um, uh, Astra Insurance is not fake news. It was reported as such by uh, KPMG. So, if you want to know what really happened there, please ask KPMG. Uh, regarding what was um, posted on our website, it was posted on our website after KPMG has done uh, a public disclosure. It was in the media. So regarding the transparency that Bogdan was uh, very concerned about, uh, we try very hard not to disclose uh, people that are affected because we don't want to um, have any kind of prejudice done to them. We don't want to uh, tarnish their image in any way. So that's why we try not to say, well, this happened or that happened. And if you're uh, thinking about uh, cybersecurity incidents, please bear in mind that each year we process around 4 million. If we were to make a list out of it, nobody in the market probably wouldn't be there. So, this is not fake news. But regarding fake news, there is an initiative from the European Commission um, to tackle that problem in the future. Uh, there is a proposal uh, about trusted flaggers and so on. We don't know how uh, things will work out in the future, but still there is something done even at European level. Thank you. Thank you. Do we, do we have another question? from the audience, people affected by this? No? 
Okay. Uh, I can ask some other questions then. <laughs> uh, do you, I can, yeah. Yeah. do you want to address the, the yeah, fake I mean, news issue or if because no, it's not no, no, it's no, not no. about naming no. and shaming companies, not, not, not but when it's obvious that something happened that uh, I don't know an electrical company. It's, it's obvious because there was a power outage. So in that case, you can't really avoid not saying it was that company because you know where the outage occurred. What's important there is that it happened because of a cyber attack and not because of a keep on failure or something like that. It happened because of a cyber attack and if it happened because of a cyber attack, other people in the sector might want to know and the public. Yeah, so I, I will not touch directly on fake news, but indirectly on the transparency a bit. Um, and um, uh, just to, to answer also to Mircha what was he was saying. So yes, it's the fear talking when I'm saying that. I'm very provocative when I'm, when I'm saying about this because we, because it's the fear talking, because we had one cybersecurity law, which was clearly unconstitutional, because we have uh, the secret service that has uh, I think 35 secret deals with other state bodies and we don't know how the data is being transmitted and uh, because it is a field that we know that uh, there are people involved and we need to, to be sure that we have the, um, uh, the guarantees in the law that at least it helps us a bit in this situation. So we, at least we, we, we have the, the bare minimum in, uh, uh, in this uh, domain. As regard to tra transparency, uh, let me give you two examples that I think are important. So a few years ago, there was a um, uh, security incident at the um, Dotoro domain name, ROTLD. And the fact was that actually they announced that, if I remember correctly, like uh, three days after or, or one week after, it was, it was very, very late. And after people, I reported it. Uh, exactly. So, yeah. Bad, bad boy, bad boy. So, uh, yeah, that's one example that is relevant. We asked for the public report after that. We said, we want to know what happened. We want to know what it can publicly be said about it. And the, I think we waited like three months for it. And basically, the, the answer that we got, we said, we had a problem, we solved the problem. And we're like, come on, that's all, all you can get us? Were the dot .ro affected? Were the domain names? Were the, uh, do we need to change the password? You know, stuff like that. So this is something that we need to address, and it, there need to be some rules very clearly in this respect. And on the other hand, there needs to be the capacity from the state companies and, and from the state institutions to reply to these kind of, of things. The second example that I want to give, um, and maybe I get the things right. So a few, a few days ago, there was uh, uh, the uh, RSA, um, um, there was discovery of vulnerability in RSA, which affected also the uh, electronic ID cards of the Estonian system. Okay, yeah, it was in the Infineon chips uh, from smart cards and TPMs in the sense that if you generated a key with those chips, Thank you. the key was much weaker than it was supposed to be. So for example, you generated 2048-bit key, it was much weaker than 2048, which meant that given enough computing power, you could factor from a public key the private key, so it compromised the whole the whole keys that were used for digital signing and people authenticating with them. And in Estonia being a very exactly. e government so, focused uh, yeah. country. So in this case, there were about 700,000 electronic IDs that were affected and were suspended by the uh, Estonian authority. And I think this is a very clear case that should ask us two questions. The first one, do we want an electronic ID card and what are the security requirements for it? And we've actually asked a lot of questions to the Ministry of Internal Affairs. And for example, we asked for a public security audit on it and they refused it. They said, no, we do an internal one, not a public one. The second question is, what should be the measures that need to be taken in this kind of securities if we'll have the electronic ID cards? And this is where the NIS directive should answer this. The, the response plan. The yes. response plan. Do you inform those persons? Do you inform them directly? Do you call them or you just tell them, you know, that your EID has been suspended? Go and update your certificate. It's, it's complicated. It's not, it's not easy, but these are the kind of cases that needs to be uh, uh, discussed. Let me answer uh, a bit of those questions. Um, first of all, related to the Estonian uh, ID cards, actually not 700,000, all of them were affected, but uh, there was no loss of uh, private information. 
Um, I was actually in Estonia when that happened, and uh, I was just talking to, to the CIO there. Okay, but yeah, is because that, that was incident? reported responsibly. Oh, yeah. Some security uh, researchers getting, found it and re reported it responsibly yeah. to Infineon, and, and they got exactly. patches from Microsoft. And I'm, it I'm wasn't getting to that point uh, right now, and uh, it, it was just a, a point answer. Um, GDPR is taking the lead into uh, transparency. Every breach that uh, has any personal information um, within it needs to be publicly reported. So this is being covered already by a regulation which has a much higher power than the, the NIST directive which uh, allows member states to uh, um, transpose it to the best of their uh, legal basis in, uh, in the but member it's, states. But it's not publicly reported, it's reported to the Data Protection Authority. It's not public. It, yeah, there well, is a difference. Uh, but you have a collection of the, all the breaches uh, in one authority, and the, um, whoever is being affected knows about it. And I think this is your uh, main concern. Well, my concern. My concern is a journalist and as a, uh, a people who inf uh, uh, someone who informs the public, and I try to be very accurate uh, in my reporting. Is that companies should be open uh, about what went wrong? And how they fixed it, and, and the, the things, they, the, the measures they had in place, and uh, be upfront about what went wrong. And in my experience, uh, in terms of brand damage and customer churn, right, where customers abandoned the, abandoned the brand, companies that were very uh, transparent and uh, upfront about what happened. Here's our, here's the vulnerability we had. Uh, here's the failure. Uh, this is why it happened, this, this is what we did, this is how we mitigated it. Those companies, uh, actually customers appreciated that, right, okay? Customers are able to understand that there's no perfect security and a breach will happen. And companies need to have the mindset that I will be breached at some point and I need to have a response plan in place. There's no perfect prevention. But when it happens, customers need to know and will appreciate knowing what went wrong and what has been done, rather than someone saying, uh, like, like in the raw TLD case, we had a problem, we fixed it, and that's all without any any details, without any anything lessons learned or anything like that. All the way to the Takama, or what's the name of the company with the airbags that disappeared in the thin air. Um, but anyhow, uh, there are companies taking a big hit, like uh, the airbag company. Uh, and there are companies that can ab absorb uh, the hit depending on the type of uh, uh, breach that they have uh, or the problems that they have. Um, uh, the point that I was uh, uh, still trying to, uh, to continue after the GDPR is that the NIST directive is actually in charge of other systems. And those systems, we need to look at them differently than we look at personal information that is being disclosed um, uh, during a breach or after a breach. Um, versus the type of um, uh, information systems that are being protected uh, with the NIST directive. Um, that information, if it contains uh, personal information, then of course uh, the breach is being reported like you said. If not, then uh, it's a critical system for the state and uh, a different type of handle needs to be uh, in place to cover that particular breach. And uh, uh, maybe that will be the, the role of CERTRO. I, I'm not sure even if the EU has been, um, um, has defined the, uh, the way of uh, uh, being transparent about this. Um, so uh, I think it's open floor yet. Yeah. Uh, just, just to clarify on this, when I said transparency, I never meant that all the reports to search should be public. What I said, there were two things. The first one is that we need to have statistical information and public information about things that happened. And I gave yesterday the example of CERT that actually in the case of the uh, crypto locker, I think it won crypto locker, they went public and they said we had three complaints, two from public sector, one from private sector. That's perfect, that's kind of information that we want to know. And the second one is related when companies are actually using uh, the relationship with CERT to prevent certain information from being public. And I also gave yesterday uh, an extreme example, but I'm provocative again, uh, with, uh, with the case that CERT.ro published on, uh, on the Weezer phishing. They published yesterday that it was a Weezer fake site that was trying to get uh, personal information, which was great. So what if Weezer would have said to CERT.ro, we have this problem with this phishing website, but we don't want to make this public. What would you do? 
So these are the kind of cases, and what I don't want to happen is that through this law, it will limit the possibility of CERT to react in the public interest. That was the point of transparency. Uh, uh, on the Wizware, uh, on the Wizware um, uh, news, just one comment. I, I like the, uh, all the domains that are uh, being used to provoke, uh, to provoke um, other phishing attacks. So you had also a list at the end of the article where you could uh, check if other campaigns similar to this one are being issued. So I also want to ask uh, to give the opportunity to Katalin to comment on the transparency because this, this proposal will go to the parliament and there's an opportunity for amendments and whether the parliament can actually uh, make them more transparent and what's your, your opinion on that? Uh, you can definitely do that. Uh, that's the role of the debate that we will have in the parliament and um, uh, actually, I want to thank you for the discussion today and it has shown that there are still uh, a lot of things on the table and I think the, the only way to improve is, is through such discussion uh, and debate. Um, we have to be very careful about the provisions there, uh, like Bogdan was, was saying, because um, they might actually, we know, uh, you know how, how state entities work and if there's a provision in the law that, that's too strict, you, sometimes you can't act in the public interest. So you have to be very careful that you don't have your, your hands tied about releasing information that, uh, that could, could actually contribute to, uh, to the public interest and, uh, and security. Um, we want to have very soon, in the next few weeks, uh, once we get the, the draft law, um, or, or, or the, the, the project, actually, in the parliament, uh, uh, a debate, and, and it will be open for, for all stakeholders. Uh, we're waiting for you there. Gentlemen, sorry to uh, barge in, but we're kind of uh, done with our time. So I will leave room for one question, and uh, then we're going to go to lunch. Okay. Do we have open question? I could do a comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. he wants to do a, co a comment as well, so. Uh, uh, just uh, to add something to the Wizzair case. Um, actually, if Wizzair uh, would have come to search row and said that uh, they don't want this uh, public, uh, if we strictly apply what is in the directive, uh, the authority would uh, would be obliged to communicate to the public in in order to um, to actually stop this uh, and alert the public not to visit those sites. So, so I guess what Bogdan is saying that there needs to be in the law more clarity about what kind of information is supposed to stay confidential, like business secrets and things like that, to protect the business interest of the company, and what information cannot be secret, and will make it out to the public if needed and if you want to, uh, to add okay to so the comment uh, is this uh, regarding transparency uh, Certro does not publish uh, affected parties however in the uh, um, for the sake of public interest when it is a phishing campaign we will publish it it doesn't matter that the name is uh, Weezer or whatever uh, if there are people that could get infected, we will publish it because one of the uh, main things that Sertro has to do is to provide a safer environment and you can do that only by uh, sharing this kind of knowledge with the public. Regarding the uh, role of the NIS directive uh, on uh, ID cards and, and digital signatures, please bear in mind that there is a directive on AIDAS uh, you should check that out. Um, it's not uh, what the NIS directive is dealing with. However, it should be compl uh, complementary. Okay, thank you. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists today for, for making the time to come here and, and uh, go through all of their, these questions and explain their point and share their point of view. And thanks all of you for attending and I hope you found this informative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.